So in this video, we're going to be talking about the aperture function g of x of a lens. And the reason we want to do that is we want to bring uh, the most famous and most important element of geometric optics into uh, our, our con conception of Fourier optics. And we want to be able to analyze this lens in terms of Fourier optics. So we can use the result in the last video because we figured out what the, uh, what the aperture function is for just this plate of glass. So this plate of glass has some distance L or some length L to it. And so if this is our x coordinate, we also said that this length might be a function of x. And if it is a function of x, we can make it look like a lens. And so here we're just going to analyze a, a simple one-sided, so plano convex lens, just because it'll make our lives easier. So what is the aperture function g of x of this element here? And for now, we're going to ignore the finite extent of the lens. So we're not going to worry about the aperture function needing to be multiplied by this square function uh, with some distance, let's call this a, or some length a. Um, for now, don't worry about that, but uh, keep that in the back of your mind, that that's something you're going to have to do. So we saw in the last video that the uh, aperture function for some glass plate of thickness L uh, is just e to the j n minus 1 k, uh, and where k is let's call this k naught. This is 2 pi divided by the wavelength in free space uh, times L is a function of x. So all we need to do is figure out what is L of x of this lens, or what is the, what is the length as a function of x. And if this is a spherical lens, so this is our x coordinate, and let's define this as our origin, is 0. So if this is a spherical lens, this is our coordinate z, uh, we know the equation for a sphere, so we can write down uh, what the equation is that s satisfies this lens. And in our case, it's just x squared plus z squared is equal to r squared. But this z, uh, this is nothing but the L of x that we defined previously. So uh, we can treat it as its own coordinate, or we can treat it as being a function of x. So we can just replace it here. So x squared plus L of x squared is equal to r squared. Or uh, moving the x squared on the other side and taking the square root, we just get that L of x is r squared minus x squared. Uh, and strictly speaking, there should be a plus or minus, but we're, well, we're only going to worry about positive lengths here. Um, we can factor out the r to make this r times 1 minus x squared over r squared. And the reason I did this uh, is because now we're going to do what we always do, uh, and we're going to make the paraxial approximation. Uh, in other words, we're going to assume that this x coordinate, that the extent of the lens, is much smaller than the radius. And for this diagram I've drawn here, that's clearly not the case, because look at how round this thing is. Uh, but in general, lenses are designed so that they're relatively flat. Uh, and so this, this may not be a fantastic approximation, but it's pretty good. Uh, and so we're just going to use Taylor series expansion of, of this guy. 1 square root of 1 plus epsilon is approximately 1 plus 1 half epsilon, where we're just keeping the linear term. And in that case, this L of x just becomes r minus x squared over 2r. And so this is a parabolic so this is a parabola, it's in terms of x squared. So we're effectively approximating this sphere by a parabola. And that becomes a better and better approximation as the, uh, as the sphere gets closer and closer to, uh, or gets thinner and thinner. So now all we have to do is plug this back into our original equation that we figured out. And if we do that, we'll get e to the j n minus 1 k, and now times l of x, which is just r, and so I'm going to separate out these exponentials. So now we've got minus j and minus 1 k times x squared over 2r. And we see that this phase, or this complex exponential, is a function of r, but it's not a function of x. So this is just a constant phase delay, and uh, this is hardly ever going to matter unless you're doing things like interferometry. And so we're just going to drop this. Uh, we're going to ignore it, and we're going to sort of remember that it's, that, that it's there and maybe bring it back at some point, but probably not. 
Uh, and so the part that we're most interested in is this guy, this, this phase term, which is a function of x. Now notice something kind of interesting. Do you recognize this, this n minus 1 over r? Uh, if you've taken a class in geometric optics, you might notice that for a, or you might see for a plano convex lens, 1 over f is just n minus 1 divided by the radius of curvature r. And so we can replace this with the focal length to get e to the minus j, uh, e to the minus j kx squared over 2 times the focal length. And so this is our aperture function. This is g of x for a lens. And we figured it out just for a plano convex lens, but you might imagine if you put two plano convex lens right, right next to each other, you just have another term in terms of the, uh, so instead of 1 over r, you'd have 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2, or minus, I guess, depending on the sign convention you're using. But you could still make this substitution in terms of the focal length, and you'd get the same exact aperture function. So now the question is, how do we interpret this? Uh, so if I've got a lens, uh, and say I've got this electromagnetic field, maybe it's not a plane wave, but maybe it's just some field that I'm advancing. So let's call this, uh, I don't know, G of X and Z. Um, right as this field hits the plane wave, uh, or sorry, right as this uh, field hits the lens, we can treat this lens as an infinitely thin so we're treating this lens as an infinitely thin aperture, which I'm just going to draw in blue, which has an aperture function g of x. And so all we need to do is multiply our initial electromagnetic field, so the electromagnetic field right in front of the lens, so whatever field we get right in front of the lens, multiply that by g of x of our lens, and we have our electromagnetic field at the back of the lens. So if we call this g in and we call this g out, uh, then g out is just equal to g in times the aperture function of our lens, g lens, which we know now is just equal to uh, this guy that we derived up above here, uh, e to the minus, whoop, e to the minus j k x squared over two times the lens focal length. And so this is how we now deal with lenses in our system. Now, if this were a plane wave that we were sending into the lens, we know from geometric optics that we should, at the output, get a wave, a spherical wave that's converging to a single point. And so that tells us that this spherical wave is actually represented with a parabolic phase, or with this x squared phase. Now, you might want to ask, how does this lens behave with the angular spectrum. So what happens if I feed it in some g of kx? Uh, can I just multiply by some transfer function? So uh, let's call this g out. Can I just multiply by some h uh, by my g in? And in this case, no, because we're actually, a lens is performing multiplication in space. So in frequency uh, or spatial frequency, we would actually need to perform a convolution. So g out in this case is actually equal to h convolved with g in of kx. And that's kind of weird, and that's uh, totally uh, not what we would expect using the formalism of things like uh, electrical engineering or signals and systems. Typically, we like our transfer functions to be multiplicative, but in this case, it's actually not. So uh, lenses happen to be easier to deal with in space because space performs, uh, because it's performing a multiplication in space. It's performing a convolution in frequency. And if you're curious, uh, h, if you, all you need to do is perform the Fourier transform of this guy, but h is just e to the plus j kx squared times f divided by 2k. And there's some normalization factor out front, which I've totally ignored, but this is the interesting uh, qualitative part, that it's, it's quadratic in frequency. So the most important takeaway is that transfer functions do not work the same way for lenses. Uh, they actually work with convolution because they're multiplication in space.
So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, please give it a like below and su subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching.